Okay, so let's talk about the central nervous system. This um, is one of the most mysterious uh, parts of the uh, human body. It's also um, one of the most interesting. The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and so we'll talk about the anatomy, some of the complexity of it, and then we'll get right into some illustrative disorders that help us understand the, the engineering challenges that are faced and that'll bring us to instrumentation and uh, uh, therapies. By the way, always feel free to pipe in with, with questions as we go. And I'll have questions for you, actually, along the way. So this is the human brain. Uh, it's uh, got uh, several broad structural uh, separations. The spinal cord is divided into individual components, uh, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. The cerebellum helps control movement. We'll delve into that later. There are some relay stations in here that help with the communication of sensory information and also the output of motor control in the middle. And then the cerebral hemispheres uh, are at the surface and are where some of the most high level uh, uh, function is thought to reside. So what is this all for? Well, you know, we think it's there to help orchestrate behavior uh, by adapting and storing information and guiding movement to be appropriate uh, for an environment. Um, and the units of computation, we don't know, but we think they're neurons. They might not, that might not be the relevant level of granularity. It might be synapses or it might be groups of neurons. And, and this is the the essence of the mysteries that we face. We don't know the primitives, the core units of computation in the brain, but there are ideas, and we'll, we'll, we, th these are things that can actually be explored quantitatively. But whatever it is doing, it's pretty amazing. The outcome, perception, consciousness, control, uh, and uh, the central nervous system we'll talk about today, and then we'll get into the peripheral nervous system and, and then the output into musculoskeletal uh, later. So I always like to keep sort of the this very biggest picture in mind. Maybe it's because I'm a psychiatrist, but even when we're talking about neurons and, and synapses, consciousness is something that, uh, you know, it's kind of funny that there's a philosopher named David Chalmers who's divided this question of consciousness into the easy and the hard problems. And it's a little bit tongue in cheek because the easy problems are some of the hardest problems that we face in, in biology, but there's even a really much harder thing uh, uh, beyond that. When you think about consciousness, the very highest level version of what uh, human brain does, uh, and you think about what people sometimes refer to as consciousness, it's the ability to process information, uh, ability to, to report on or comment on your mental states, access your own mental states, attention to them, to control behavior, to be awake or not. People have used the word consciousness to apply to all of these, but there's even a sort of a philosophically deeper question for consciousness, which is, the subjective sense. When we see something red, you know, we there's information processing. We register it as red, but there's there's more than that. There's a subjective sense. There's a quality of redness. Uh, there's a there's a, something that it means to be red to us, and that's something that presumably a computer doesn't uh, have. What that means is actually an active area of de debate and research by serious neuroscientists. And um, that's something if you're interested in, uh, I can help uh, uh, guide you to some resources. We'll get there uh, actually a little. Uh, a little bit later in the course. But back to this, this is uh, the, the information flow. There's, it's bidirectional from the spinal cord up and from the brain out. And the discrimination between white matter and gray matter you might have heard about. If you just take a piece of brain and you slice it and you look at it, there's parts that look white and there's parts that look uh, brownish uh, gray. The white part is very fatty. It's very got a very high lipid content. That's why it looks like uh, congealed fat. And the reason it's fatty is the, the axons, the long range uh, projections, are sheathed in a fatty tissue, which acts as a, uh, effectively like an uh, insulator that influences the capacitance of the membrane. And this uh, improves the fidelity of long range transmission uh, for reasons that we'll talk about. And this is more or less exactly what it looks like. If you take a slice through the brain, in the human brain, there's about a two millimeter thick rim of uh, neurons that's at the surface. And all of this whitish stuff is this uh, lipid sheathed uh, uh, long range wiring. The actual cell bodies are just limited to this thick region on the surface. There are some subcortical, what are called subcortical regions, clusters of deep uh, gray matter. But you can see the volume is vastly uh, dominated by the actual uh, wiring rather than the, the cells that give rise to the, 
Obviously, this is going to set major constraints on interventions. If you think about, are we going to stick an electrode in here to stimulate or record, you know, um, physical constraints that this sets and the targets that it provides are, are going to be very important. And so that's why knowing the anatomy uh, is important for engineers. Now information flows in, information goes out. Afferents is information coming in. Uh, there are major classes of information. There's somatic, classically think about as, as sensory. Proprioceptive, that's if you close your eyes, you still know where your joints and limbs are in space, and that's because there are little stretch receptors that, that report back to your brain on the angle uh, of your joints, and so you've got awareness of yourself even without other kinds of sensory. sensory. Then uh, there's visceral. This is corresponding to nonspecific abdominal, for example, uh, type sensations you can get. It's not localizable to a particular uh, spot, but there are all kinds of stretch receptors in your intestines, on blood vessels, and they can report uh, very general feelings, even general malaise feelings, but they're coming from direct uh, uh, sensory signals coming from uh, blood vessels and internal organs. And then there are the specialized uh, senses, sight, hearing, uh, smell, and balance. And those flow in, uh, in most cases, uh, into the spinal cord. Uh, the origins of those fibers arise, for example, from the skin, and there are multiple synaptic relays along the way. Information comes out. This is the efferent. Remember that E for exit. Uh, this is uh, very uh, significant in terms of thinking about therapies as well. If someone uh, is suffering from a stroke or has, has had damage to the brain, many of their control capabilities are limited because there's been damage to the efferent pathways. And so they can sense, they can think, they can plan actions, but they just can't execute them. And uh, there are neurons that are <coughs> involved in controlling the efferent flow of activity that uh, line what's called the uh, motor cortex, parts of the brain that control motor function and resolution and precision of the muscles that control uh, those uh, parts of the body are represented according to their complexity in terms of the real estate that they're allowed on the brain. It's pretty interesting if you have an amputation, if you lose function, you actually can have the, the, the representation both for motor and sensation is still there in the brain at least for, for cause problems. Sensory uh, problems, you can have what's called phantom limb pain. Even if the limb is gone, you can still feel pain from the limb which is because of abnormal action in the fibers and the neurons that formerly represented that limb. There are interesting correlates of that in other parts of the brain. People are of chronic blindness. There's a syndrome called uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome where very complex hallucinations are seen. Uh, this is not schizophrenia. It's not uh, psychosis. Uh, but it's, uh, it's kind of the equivalent of phantom limb pain, except in the part of the brain that controls vision. So chronic deprivation uh, can lead to unregulated and spontaneous activity in the part of the brain that, that was involved in carrying out that uh, process. All we know is that sort of phenomenon. We don't understand the physiology behind that, so it's actually very hard to treat. People try giving general dampers of neural activity, kind of like anti-epileptic drugs, things that quiet everything down, shut down ion channels for this sort of thing. They're very nonspecific. They have huge side effects that cause sedation, sleepiness, cognitive problems, and that highlights some of the, the issues that we have in, in neuroscience. The outputs come all the way down through the spinal cord that control uh, action, and if you cut a slice through the spinal cord, there's uh, you know two basic sides to it. There's the sensory part, the dorsal part, and then there's the motor part or the ventral. So the motor neurons have their cell bodies in what's called a ventral horn, and they come out and act on muscles, sensory muscles, what are called dorsal root ganglion cells. These can actually, this is a reflex arc. It operates without even action on the uh, brain. You can have autonomous processing and reaction. It happens entirely within the spinal cord. As you go to higher levels, uh, you get more complex processing, and so the spinal cord, as you go up, ends about here, and then you have uh, structures called the medulla and the pons. And these regulate very primitive 
very important functions, uh, respiration, digestion, heart rate, sleep, uh, uh, vasomotor control, that means blood pressure and uh, blood vessels, flexes, and then as you get to the pons, that gets to slightly higher level things, posture and balance. These are, you can't live without these. If, if they're creating tumors that arise in the pons, they cannot be surgically removed because uh, any attempt to carry out surgery in the pons will uh, be uh, essentially shut down fundamental uh, processes that are required. Typically limits you to chemotherapy and radiation. If the tumor is not responsive to those, there's uh, really no successful treatment. Uh, continuing progression up toward more advanced uh, parts of the brain, we get to the cerebellum, which is a fascinating structure. It actually, even though it's small, it has 90% of all the neurons in the brain live in the cerebellum because it's got a lot of extremely tiny neurons called granule cells. And it controls movement classically. That's what it's thought to involve. Um, but it also may have um, uh, some cognitive role as well. It's thought it might play a role in sequencing uh, thought just as it plays a role in sequencing of motor actions. If you get very good at a motor action, playing the violin, uh, kicking a field goal, the motor patterns are thought to be stored there in the cerebellum, the sequencing of actions. A lot of uh, learning and plasticity that happens there. And there's basic movement, voluntary behavior, and then there's more advanced parts of the cerebellum that are called the cerebrocerebellum are thought to be involved in these. Uh, sequencing of, of actions and thoughts and, uh, that are at a higher level. In addition to having a vast number of neurons, some of the most complex neurons are in the brain. This, the Purkinje cells um, uh, have uh, about 100,000 synapses per cell. By the way, the number of different, which histologists you talk to, the number here is 70 to 90 percent of all CNS neurons that are cerebellar granule cells. All, uh, uh, histologists agree, Purkinje cells, which are a beautiful uh, cell that has a very enormous dendritic uh, tree, uh, has a probably tenfold greater synapses than your average synapse, in, uh, your average cell in the brain. Most cells in the brain have about 10,000. These have about 100,000 per cell. Those are the incoming uh, connections that, that are uh, uh, present on the cells, dendrites, which are its input. Uh, next level up, uh, get to the midbrain and the diencephalon, and here uh, we start to get into some pretty interesting disease relevant uh, uh, structures. Um, the midbrain, so called mesencephalon, has uh, the source of many uh, neurotransmitters that are involved in diseases like Parkinson's disease and depression. Uh, the substantia nigra is a particular part of the brain that histologically shows up as, as very dark, and that's because it makes uh, dopamine, which uh, is an important neurotransmitter, and uh, the enzymes that are required for production of dopamine make the structure uh, end up looking dark on histology. But you can actually see those neurons are lost in Parkinson's, and then the structure uh, uh, looks different. You can just look at the brain and see this person must have. Um, you can't do that with psychiatry. They're not nearly as criteria for uh, Getting up almost to the downtown region now, we're up into the diencephalon. Uh, this is where the thalamus lives. Um, this is where a lot of incoming sensory information has a way station. There's a synapse here. Uh, there are a lot of neurons here that then send information up to cortex, and there's a lot of uh, important processing that happens there. You have a lesion to the thalamus, like with a stroke or damage, you get very interesting neglect syndromes, where you have somebody who appears normal but will simply not be conscious of stimuli coming from the part of the world that that part of the thalamus uh, registers. And this shows up in fascinating ways. If you ask them to draw a clock, someone with uh, a lesion to one side of the thalamus will, the thalamus will draw just half a clock. They'll uh, draw the numbers all bunched onto one side of the clock. And so this sort of very high level awareness of uh, space and of the world is sensitive to lesions in the thalamus. It's where a lot of that is integrated. There's a little structure under the thalamus called the hypothalamus, which is also pretty interesting. It's the site of most of our basic drives. It tells you what you want and how much of it you want. There are neurons there that control hunger, thirst, 
respiration, sex, sleep, anger. What's interesting is they're all jumbled together. So they're, it's not as if there's a, a sex region and a sleep region. They're, those different neurons are all mixed together side by side. And that is, makes it hard for treatment, right? You couldn't put an electrode and correct someone's sleep disorder because you drive all these different neurons uh, at the same time. So that also is an interesting thing for engineers to think about is how are we going to, uh, if someone has narcolepsy or something like that, some very serious sleep disorder, and if that's all regulated, these jumbled up neurons in the hypothalamus, how on earth are we going to come in and selectively control them? Even if we target an electrode or a pulse of energy of some kind, it's not going to be sufficient. There's almost no, you know, other structure where this problem is as acute. There are related problems in other structures. If you think about the heart, as we'll get to, at least we know the heart's a pump. We can see the different parts that are involved in pumping and sending blood from one part to another, and we know the electrical conduction pathways, and we can put an electrode and stimulate. In many ways, uh, the heart, though, is complex in its own right, and it's not at all simple. Uh, but it's a much, much more challenging problem in the brain. Then we get into pretty high-level uh, cortical and subcortical structures. There's this fascinating uh, banana-shaped structure called the hippocampus, which, where short-term memories are stored. If you learn something, in the moment, the memories that you formed a minute ago or a day ago are stored in the hippocampus. And over the course of a month or two or six months, those memories get offloaded to cortex for very long-term storage, and they get erased from the hippocampus. So it's like a short-term memory uh, buffer of sorts. Uh, it's an interesting structure for other reasons, too. Uh, people who have depression and people who are susceptible to post-traumatic stress disorder seem to have smaller hippocampi. This is just based on structural imaging. It's not known if this is causal or if it's a vulnerability factor. These are open questions. One of the very few anatomical findings that we have in psychiatry is that's pretty consistent. The hippocampus is a little smaller in, in depression, also in schizophrenia. It is. We, we can't image it as well as we'd like. There's a lot of substructure within it that we can't resolve. Uh, but you can actually see the hippocampus pretty well on a standard MRI, um, and you can quantify its size pretty well. Um, the limits of MRI and CT scanning are something we'll get to in a little bit. But, and even that's just structural. Of course, we don't have act as much activity information as we would like. We can get that by other means. Then there's this uh, little spherical structure at the end, the amygdala, that's involved in uh, sort of adding valence, positive or negative, color to your experiences. Uh, it's most classically associated with negative, rage, fear, anxiety, uh, but it also does play a role in positive, uh, rewarding, or addictive experiences as well. So it sort of adds a, a sort of value to experience. Both of these, both. Both of these structures communicate heavily with the parts of your brain that plan action, which are the cortical uh, structures. This is one other interesting thing about the hippocampus. This is a drawing done by a, a Nobel Prize winning Spanish anatomist named Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who in the early 1900s, he sort of marched through the brain, he and his students drawing these beautiful diagrams using a very specific stain called a Golgi stain that highlighted sparse neurons. but highlighted them very well, and that's illustrated here. Uh, you know, he found these neurons, traced them out in great detail. The hippocampus, this is like a slice through the banana, so on your, you know, it's like a slice of, of a banana that you'd put on your cereal. And if you do that, you see this interesting structure. There's a, a fiber pathway coming in. There's one layer of neurons that's called the dentate gyrus. Information coming out. There's another layer called CA3. Cornu aminus, Ammon's horn. Some early anatomists thought this looked like a. That goes to another layer, CA1, and that goes out. And so it's like a three layered neural network, okay? Feed forward neural network. This is actually the kind of thing that got me into neuroscience initially. And there's all kinds of interesting stuff going on here. There's synaptic plasticity. This is where synaptic strengths change particularly well. That happens everywhere in the brain, but particularly robustly here. And in the dentate gyrus, that's where 
it's the only site in the human brain where new neurons are formed in adulthood. And there's a lot of interesting questions surrounding that. Why in this first layer of this neural network that's involved in short-term memory, why is that the only place where adult neurons are, are uh, that's a really interesting question we might come back to. And then finally, the, the pinnacle of evolution, cerebral cortex, this uh, um, occupies uh, most of our uh, cerebral volume. Uh, it's got basic lobular subdivisions. The occipital lobe in the back uh, is involved in vision. Temporal lobe, heavily involved in uh, auditory experience. The hippocampus is embedded within the temporal lobe uh, as well. The uh, parietal lobe is heavily involved in sensation. Uh, strip of sensory cortex here where all the incoming sensory information comes out. Involved in the mathematical reasoning. Uh, frontal lobes are involved in planning, communication, uh, long-term goal-directed uh, activity. 